Hello, welcome to The Stir, conversations with people who inspire, fascinate, and bring us joy. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin. So technically, this is our seventh episode of The Stir, and it is, but it's our first episode in a series we're calling Shelter in Place, or SIP, our SIP series. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, and here we are. We've all been affected by this COVID-19 pandemic, some of us definitely more than others. I just want to stress that our SIP series is meant to entertain and to offer some diversion in what is a very serious time. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to my co-pilot. A lot of you already know her. She's a fan favorite of The Stir. She is a TV show creator and producer. She's a columnist. She's a writer. And here she is. Friends, say hi to Debbie Baldwin. Hey, Debbie. Hey, Trish. How's it going? Uh, well, I have three college-age kids, all whom I was really kind of getting used to my empty nest. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so it's sort of like a swarm of locusts invaded the house, and every bite of food is eaten. It doesn't usually make it even to the cupboard. It's just from the car from the grocery store, grocery store, groceries in the car, to the path, to the door, there's half as many as there were when I did the actual shopping. So, And I know you also have a doggy too. So in addition to the kids, there's a doggy to keep in mind there as well. Yes. And she seems blissfully unaware of <laughs> the order and is just very happy to have lots of people to snuggle with. So... There you go. That's that's the the joy in this. Find the the positive. And um, yes, you're right about you know all of a sudden having to reverse oneself again when there were no people. You were getting used to that idea, and then full house once again. So you and I have been going back and forth about how to entertain oneself in a in a situation like this. And and lucky for both of us, we're really into binge watching TV shows, movies, sometimes even binge reading some books. You know, we discussed this earlier. Um, when you appeared in our show a couple weeks ago, um, just talking about anything that keeps our mind entertained and in fantasy land. And, you know, we like things that also keep us thinking and just fun stuff that, that we always like to talk about. And so tell me, what have you been consumed by? Are we what, now we're in week two of this um, shelter in place? We are in, I guess, officially week two, although I had a child who was doing a study abroad program in Italy. So we have been on lockdown for uh, going on a month now in our house. Um, luckily, no, n you know, no signs of any sort of even a sniffle. But we've had lots of times to explore. Um, alternative forms right. of entertainment for, you know as opposed to going out and meeting friends going to restaurants and stuff like that so uh, the obvious choice is binge watching tv owning yes. a show that really you know draws you in and, and even before the situation came up you and i have already talked about some of our favorites you know the, and there are so many streaming services now from even five years ago ten years ago that it's it's really hard to keep track of what's on, what's where, what's hot now, and what may be coming up, uh, you know, down the road. But I wanted to bring attention to, it seems like everyone now has Netflix or has had to get Netflix just because you have to find ways to, you know, you can't go to the movies right now. Um, you can't do a lot of the stuff that we would normally do. So let's talk about some show so talk about some series on netflix first that we're completely into what are I, some of I, your favorites I, well i finished netflix <laughs> what, what you, think you, you finished I'm netflix on, on amazon prime now and soon to be on to apple um, oh boy but no um obviously there's a lot trending on netflix i'm just looking quickly at what i wrote down and what i've watched um the big show that everyone's talking about right now is tiger king 
Wait. All right, tell me a little bit about that because I'm I'm still on the fence about mm, is this something that would really interest me? I you know, I'm very conservative with my time. Even with when we're confined like this, you find that you're still um having to budget your time accordingly or it'll go crazy. Yeah. Um so tell me a little bit about Tiger King. Um you know, it almost harkens back to for me like the days of like the circus freak show, like the, the crazy, unusual, disadvantaged characters that, you know, you watch and the story is of this man who owns, um, I don't know what the exact term is. I would call it like a big cat park, like an attraction park. Yes. In the Midwest. And Ha, is a very unusual guy. He's, you know, got a mullet and he's, uh, I've seen the photos. Magical. Yeah. It's just, uh, and he's a, a quirky guy and <laughs> okay. he has all of these big cats and they have a big, you know, there's obviously this huge component of animal rights and that people shouldn't own these creatures and, you know, they talk about at the beginning of the docu-series, it's only a three-part series, it's fairly quick to watch, about how, you know, you could be driving through certain parts of Texas and like, you know, the pet, like the pet store sells tiger food because so many people like own these animals that, you know, really should not. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, you like, see some of the signs along the highway, if you're road tripping, you see the billboards um, for such places. Right, right. And um, so, if, you know, if, if he's the protagonist in the story, I mean, many would argue he's not, that he's the, the, the anti-hero, that the, his opposing force is this animal rights activist woman who owns a sanctuary in Florida who's attempting to rescue these animals and shut down these parks. And no character in the story is without flaws. And... I mean, mainly it's just a glimpse into a very crazy world with some very unusual people. And so you've I've seen watched, all three episodes? I have not. I've only seen the first one. Okay. So, and based on that first episode, are you likely to continue to episodes two and three? You know, I don't know. I, um... It, it's not the kind of thing that really... I like shows that have a little more, mm, it's hard to articulate. It's either your thing or it isn't your thing. And this, sure, really sure. Is thing. you know, I, I get it, but it's, you can only watch, you sort of get what they're doing right away. And if you want to watch the resolution of it, you know, it, it ends up, you know, spiraling into this murder for hire plot. And oh my goodness. Okay. Or I think is in jail I mean, it, at the time of the shooting of the filming, he was in jail. So, you know, it's going to play out in a very... So you're either drawn to this man or not. Right. Tiger He's... King, I guess that's who yeah. he is. And so, well, thank you for, for enlightening me because I was thinking Siegfried and Roy kind of stuff. You no, know, I mean, <laughs> and just to like, give you a little inside, like two of the first three characters they interview in Sidebar are missing limbs. Like, they have a... Uh, one woman has like a is missing an arm and another character has uh, prosthetic legs and you're like, oh my lord, like are the, I I mean, I haven't gotten far enough to know the cause of the amputation, but I'm completely <laughs> getting you now. So it is an acquired taste. It appeals to certain kind of people. A, um, so that actually is very helpful. And so, you know, it's an interesting bridge into the show Cheer because exactly way, i was just thinking about that it's this formation of family that is what's really i think compelling about this show and certainly cheer where these people these characters have nothing i mean well, these are documentaries so they're people not characters um and that they their attachments outside of this world they're in are so tenuous that you can see how the world that they're living in is appealing to them and how you're drawn in as a viewer because you see these connections being formed and 
and you understand why. So, you know, Cheer is another docu-series on Netflix. It's um, a 10-part series, I think. Yeah, it was either 10, 12, or 13, but um, you're right. It's fairly short. It's just the one season so far. And I seem to remember right at the onset of Cheer, you had already um, kind of hinted that, Trish, this is probably something you want to see. Um, and I had misgivings as well because, you know, cheerleading is really not my cup of tea. Again, right. either you like cheerleading or you don't. But seriously, Deb, when you told me about it, I gave it a try. I watched the first episode and I was actually hooked because it it really does give you reason to to root for these people that you don't even know. But yet it's the way that the story is told for each one of the cheerleaders um, their backstories are so compelling that you can't help but not be um, interested in what happens to them. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I very rarely I, I can lose interest in a show at the drop of a hat, and it's very rare that I'm one of those people who just lets the show go to the next episode automatically and just sits through it. But with cheer, I I mean, I watched the entire thing in two days. It's just the woman who's the coach. I mean, what a compelling story. She's got yes. an, an MBA from University of Texas. She's a very accomplished, intelligent woman. I think and she has a background in finance. I mean, that's what finance. she went to school for. Um, so we're talking about um, the Navarro College cheerleading team. Um, a very, very small town in Texas. And I believe it is actually a, a community college. Junior college, yeah. Yes. Corsicana, Texas is the name of the town. Um, it's a little blip on the map. Um, you wouldn't normally know about it, except for this show where it really surely has put them on the map because they are um, repeat national champions for this team. And this really just shows you the, the progression of how you get from, you know, your starting point to being national champs. And my goodness, Deb, the stuff that they go through and they put their bodies through, it's uh, it's pretty intense. I know. And, and not, those like two halves to, that, that come together to make that show, the, the information about college level cheering and the intensity and that it's a sport as much as the teams playing on the field that they're cheering for, maybe even more so with a lot of them, the injuries, the danger, the athleticism, all of that stuff is riveting, I think. And then to combine that with this group of students and this coach who, you know, every single kid you just connect with, it's just a great documentary series. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so let's kind of continue this backwoods, backwoods theme and, and move on. Let's talk about Ozark. Oh, oh my. We just dropped. So that's <laughs> a great series. And if you are new to Ozark, you're in luck because, um, you know, it's now three full series. All, all the episodes are available on Netflix. Um, the show stars Jason Bateman and Laura Linney and Laura Linney and um he is just I don't I, I love watching him ever from Arrested Development on he's been one of my favorite actors to watch yeah. you know I would say he displays a tremendous range but he's certainly an appealing guy to watch on screen and he plays a money manager who gets in over his head and ends up moving to a small town in the Ozarks to launder money for a criminal. To get out of whatever mess he got himself into. Exactly. And so Ozark, um, I'm a pretty squeamish person. This show got ugly pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, what, the second episode? I, you know, and, and uh, I had to stop watching it because it was just too intense for me and it would give me nightmares. Yeah. Uh, but, I'm quite excited that the, the third season has dropped because you're right, because now you can really, truly binge watch this, this great show. Yeah. And it's, you know, just a, it's a, a nice combination of, of, you know, funny and gruesome, as you know, you said, it's just a weird show, which is 
you know, I think most people think of the Ozarks in general as kind of a weird place. I mean, it's this beautiful, you know, they go, they talk again and again in the show about how it has the most coastline of any place in the country and, the, and more than California. Right, and right. Lake and the, the, you know, the incredible natural beauty. Exactly. A the, lot of it is untouched. And one of the um, pros, I guess, if you would call it that, of, of being, of having to stay at home is that they're actually saying that the waterways and the, the natural beauty of the Ozarks actually has never been, has never looked better just because right now it's untouched, it's unpolluted. So everything looks nice. Um, and I think you're seeing that phenomenon, you know, worldwide yeah. in terms of a lot of these places that Absolutely. are normally packed with tourists. Um, so yeah, you're, you're right about that. One hang up I do have about the show. I mean, they're going to call it Ozark, but they shoot in Georgia. <laughs> Go figure that. Well, yeah. And that's, I mean, that happens more often than it doesn't. I, I mean, I can't even think of a show right now that's, set someplace where it's actually shot. <laughs> I do have one and kind of switching gears a little bit. And I mentioned this to you when you told me about cheer, I mentioned insatiable uh -huh. um, to you, which is a little different genre. It's a comedy kind of like a really quirky out there comedy. Um, it is shot in Georgia and it does take place in Georgia. And um, just uh, I'm mentioning it because uh, we have a St. Louisan who is one of the stars of the show, uh, Erin Westbrook, who graduated from Burroughs. She plays Magnolia in the show. And um, the more you progress into the show, um, she actually her role has gotten on more prominent. And I can't wait till the next season where, you know, I'm sure the character is going to get even more um, built up. Yeah. You've seen a couple of episodes? And for people who don't know, it's a black comedy about a guy, uh, a struggling attorney in a small town who has this closet, I'm going to say fetish, <laughs> pageant girls. And um, so he coaches girls in beauty pageants and, you know, tries to have you know live up to his father's expectations in his law practice but his true love is this sort of you know think michael kane in in um uh oh, what's the sandra bullock movie um oh 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 con miss congeniality congeniality yeah <laughs> yeah and it calls to mind the show to me has a very, if you remember the movie Heathers with Christian Slater, like Correct. it has that sort of black, uh, but light hearted, like uh, um, facade, um, yeah. like a, the, uh, the evil underbelly under the beautiful Southern town. And it's very funny. So did you see the entire show yet? No, I'm about halfway through the first season. Okay. Um, because there's going to come a point where it, it takes quite a turn. And, you know, the, the, the term dark comedy has never rang truer than yeah. when you get to that part. And you'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean. But I wanted to, you know, in attention to talking about Erin Westbrook, who's our um, St. Louis girl, I also wanted to mention Alyssa Milano is in this show. And yeah. for those of you who are fans of 80s TV, she was um, with Tony Danta and Who's the Boss? And Tony and Danza also, is also in a show. Say that again. Tony Danza is also in a show. Oh. Um, it is a Netflix show called, I think it's called The Good Cop, where he plays um, a, a father of a young, ambitious police detective. And the, the, as the father, he was fired from the force for corruption. And the son is trying to be this ultra by the book police officer. And um, I've only watched the pilot of that, but uh, you know, just for the who's the boss people of the crowd. Got it. So is he? Um, is this supposed to be a comedy or a drama? Um, I would say it's a light drama so far. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I I followed Tony Danza because of who's the boss. I can't say I'm a huge fan, but you know, he's one of those guys. He just seems really nice and you want the best for him. 
And Alyssa, back to Insatiable, I, I will say, I think Melissa, Alyssa, Alyssa Milano has never looked better. I mean, oh my God, yes, yes, really, you're right about that. You know, eased into that, you know, a lot of act, female actors in particular have difficulty with that transition from, you know, child to ingenue to now parent. Yes. And, you know, she's the parent of teenage kids in this, in this uh, show. And I, I think she's terrific. Oh, and you can see and you can tell that she's having a lot of fun with that role. It's such a, uh, you see. It's such a, an interesting role to play. Yeah. And um, also mm -hmm. wanted to ask you what you thought about Dallas Roberts, who is um, one of the leading men. He is our pageant guy. Okay. For some reason, I don't know if, if you are thinking the same way, but he reminds me so much of John Ritter. His totally. face. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I had to look up whether this was his son and it's not, you know, it's Jason Ritter and right. he's a completely different guy, but his facial expressions, his, his demeanor, the way he acts, this reminds me of Jack Tripper from Three's Company. Well, and I was going to say the fact that the role is so sexually ambiguous, you know, he does cast these very longing glances at the, the male other Bob. <laughs> um, okay, you know, so there's a lot of like kind of subtle ambiguity going on there. Brings to mind Jack Tripper and Three's Company totally. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I just always think that every time I watch him. So I wanted to move on to, so we've talked about a comedy here. Let's talk about something that a lot of people are anticipating the next season, which is The Crown. And The Crown is I don't know when the next season of The Crown drops, but um, you know- well, I we know that it's definitely gonna be the last season. They've said that much. Right, and you know, no spoiler alerts. We <laughs> <laughs> But um, you know, that's a fantastic show. Just everything about it is very, it, it, it's, you know, up there with the Game of Thrones and you know, the, uh, is The Crown HBO? No, The Crown is Netflix. Is it Netflix? Okay. It's just, um, you know, such a well done, well acted, compelling story with that sort of salacious glimpse behind the curtain without, while staying true to the material, I think. Yes, I completely agree because along with binge watching The Crown, I also have been reading, you know, the, the book, which the material is based on and you get a little bit more in the book and, um, yeah, it's just really fascinating to see what happens behind the scenes, especially when it's somebody as uh, prominent as the Royal family. And then you see that they are people too. They go through the same issues, although on a grander scale, of course, and wearing their tiaras, but at the same time, um, it's, there are still a lot of human issues uh, that they're dealing with. You know, I really felt for um, Prince Charles, you know, when he was growing up. You, you hear about stuff like that, but when you kind of see it happen and you see some of the ways the actors interpret their roles, it's, it's really something to see. And you're right. I mean, it's so well acted. Everyone does a great job. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just in that vein of that kind of, incredibly powerful glimpse behind the curtain type shows is Succession, which is an HBO show um, about the Rupert Murdoch's empire, which is, you know, just riveting television with incredible acting and, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction kind of family drama. Sure. So is that actually based on real life events or is it the reimagining of what happened? Um, you know, I haven't researched the true, uh, you know, how closely the show sticks to the facts, but um, uh, so I, I can't answer that question, but it's great to be. <laughs> Right. I know. And that's what I've been hearing, too. It's been on my list. But again, you know, we have all these shows. You sent me a list of what you're involved with right now. And I have a same, you know, a list of the same size. So it's, it's just one of those things, finding the time to do it. But now that we've moved on to HBO, though, um, and you did mention Game of Thrones, making news a little bit last week, um, the actress who plays Daenerys, 
talked about how she was a little upset about how that ending happened. Um, Amelia Clark, of course, uh, we're talking about. And so that made a little bit of a headline last week about how she did really not envision for the ending to be like that and was a bit um, perturbed that that was the way that Daenerys Targaryen ended up. Well, you know, I, 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 there's a big part of me that thinks that actors should be very reserved when discussing the out the finales or the outcomes of their shows. I mean, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know if I even agree with her. Um, you I'm, and it's amazing that she loves the character so much that she envisioned a different story in her mind for the character. Sure, sure. But I think overall, the Game of Thrones fans were content with the way the show wrapped up. I mean, were you? Oh my goodness, yeah. I think um, you hear a lot about um, the people who make the most noise or the people who are not happy, but there's a huge majority of Game of Thrones fans, I believe, that were just satisfied with the way things ended. You know, it it stayed true to the storytelling. Um, things that were unexpected happened, which is you know, uh, that was the way the show has been th over over its run. So I think that there are plenty of ways to interpret that ending, which I liked. You know, I like to think that Jon Snow went off and lived happily ever after out in the woods, you know, somewhere. So I, I like that they did leave it open to some interpretation um, for the fans to have their say, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about show finales from, you know, The Sopranos to How I Met Your Mother. There's, you know, everyone's got their opinion on how their favorite show should end. And it's a true testament to how great the show is that people have such like, you know. Sure, sure, exactly. What you wanted to see, but it's ultimately it's the showrunner and the writer's show to conclude you know, their story and we're just watching it. So well, um, and you have experience on the other side of, of that of the fence as well. And and I think you're right. You know, the writers are the writers and you're the viewer. And so you just kind of leave it to their hands. They're telling the story. They have a vision for that story and you know, hate it or love it. It's <laughs> it's the story. It's the way they want that story to be and the way uh, the way they want that story to be resolved. Yeah, exactly. So, but you know, this is, if you've never watched Game of Thrones, <laughs> one of those shows like uh, Gre uh, Grey's Anatomy or House, one of the, these shows, Criminal Minds, Game of Thrones that have multiple, multiple seasons. And you think, oh, I could never, you know, I think Grey's Anatomy has like 19 seasons or something. I but can't believe it's been that long. This is your chance. Okay, so are you of the same opinion as I have where, you know, when ER, ER was on your list too. That's really old school. So old when school. ER was still around, it had gotten to the point where in its later um, seasons, to me, it got kind of ridiculous because every single scenario has made it to the ER, you know, some really unbelievable stuff. And it's like, really, really, really? So... There have been many times, in my opinion, where that show had jumped the shark based on whatever was going on in the ER, whatever sick case they had. Um, Grey's Anatomy began to feel like that to me, middle of its run. Um, just the ridiculousness, um, the number of the doctors who were who were offed, you know, um, the number of the doctors who. Yeah. I have to tell you, I was laughing so hard. I tuned in my daughter was what was binge watching Grey's Anatomy and she was on a later season and I kind of peeked over her shoulder to see what was happening and all I heard was Meredith Grey say this one said can you do these tests and Meredith Grey said I own this hospital I can do whatever I want and I just 
wait a minute. So somewhere along the line, she she owns the hospital now. <laughs> Apparently, and it literally sounded like something out of like an old soap opera that we used to watch. You know, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So Meredith owns. Um, is it the Seattle Grace? Right? Is the name yeah. of the hospital? I don't know. I have to say, I had a little uh, Grey's Anatomy moment way back in 2008, I believe. I don't know if you even remember, there was a huge um, industry-wide writer strike. And so all the shows went on hiatus. And it just so happened that my husband and I um, were off on a trip to um, California wine country. We were in Napa and Sonoma. And one of our stays in Sonoma, we were at a a restaurant called the girl and the fig and who comes along but dr o'malley <laughs> with his partner and they were there because of the writer's strike. nothing was going on so it was just one of those things where um you know it's like paging dr o'malley here he is yeah. coming right across my table it was it was kind of cool is there and, a doctor uh, in the house <laughs> <laughs> And that was, you know what, that was the really, really sad part of it was I could not remember his real name. <laughs> and all I was doing, Dr. O'Malley, Dr. O'Malley. I mean, it was pretty ridiculous, but he was so gracious about it. He even took a picture with me. It was T.R. Knight. T.R. Knight, yes. And, yeah, and uh, it was about a, I think it was about a homophobic slur on set that ended up ending Isaiah Washington's run on the show. And Correct. Then I left shortly thereafter. Yes, anyway, and that was kind of the beginning, the, the beginning of the bleeding for that show because shortly after T.R. Knight left, uh, you had Katherine Heigl leaving too. And so it was like, you know, and then you started infusing it with new characters, new um, Dr. Hotties and whatever their names were, McSteamy, whatever. McSteamy, um, McCarty, I know. Yes. <laughs> Running out of, of, of names for... Um, for attractive male doctors. Nothing wrong with the level of attractiveness <laughs> doctors at Seattle Grace. Very attractive crew all around. True. Again, for me though, you know, it kept my attention for the time, for a little bit of time, and then all the doctors started hooking up with each other. And I'm like, okay, come on, guys. But same I thing with ER, right? Only I thought ER did it on a a more classy scale. I don't know how you would describe that. I don't know if the story uh, line was a little bit tighter than Grey's Anatomy. I mean, maybe that's not the, the, the right way to put it. Yeah, I mean, they're both great medical shows and ER was such a pivotal show, you know, during its time. It was that show that everyone kind of raced home to watch. And, you know, I think Grey's Anatomy to some extent, at least in its first 10 years was certainly that way too. It's maybe uh, worn at its welcome a little, I, I, you know, it's kind of like, it's, maybe it's time to wrap it up with Grey's Anatomy. Um, I don't know. I think, isn't this their last season or somebody had announced that it was going to be their last season? Yeah. Um, and I like the fact that we are talking about um, medically based TV programs because of course we want to kind of wrap up our first episode of our shelter in place um, series by saying that, you know, we really, really are grateful and are appreciative of our local medical community who we know are, are on the front lines of this pandemic and they have been working 24 seven to, to help our residents or citizens and, and they have been doing um, such a good job in trying to keep up with this ever changing, ever evolving story. So, Deb, we've been talking about on-screen diversions um, for this entire run, but also it's important to note that there are other ways to use this time we have at home to, besides sitting in front of your computer and or looking at your phone, what are some of the ways that you're finding that um, is, is uh, you know, fitting the bill for you? Um, you know, I think it depends if you're trying as a parent to look for activities for your kids. I mean, my kids are all college age and getting them out of, away from a computer screen or their phone is, 
it's mind boggling to me how many hours a day they can be staring at it. And, and me too, like in this time. We've it's, been trained to do that now. You know, but they can't, you know, I notice like they'll say, I have a headache. Why do you think I have a headache? You know, they think they've got COVID. And I'm like, no, you've got Netflix. Blue screen, yeah. <laughs> you've got Huluitis. <laughs> Close your computer, take a walk. My kids have gotten really into baking while we've been, you know, locked up. We've made some really cool recipes. Ooh, you're swimming in sweets. We are swimming in sweets. It's I yeah. love that. That's that's one of the ways I like to pass the time too. I mean, our pantry has never been more stocked, so you can get creative. Um, there are so many things on the internet now in terms of what you can do. And have you guys tried? Has the Baldwin household tried the, this uh, this whipped coffee trend yet? No, tell, do tell. <laughs> Well, it's, it has its origins in South Korea. It's called Argona Coffee, and it's a whipped coffee. And I believe it started out as a TikTok um, thing, but you can see it anywhere now all over the internet, but it's very simple. It's equal parts, instant coffee, hot water, and sugar. So let's say you're making one serving. So it's two tablespoons of instant coffee, two tablespoons of sugar, two tablespoons of hot water, and then you just whip it. But the trick is you don't whip it by hand. You really have to use a hand mixer because if you're whipping it by hand, it'll take you like 20 minutes and a very sore hand. <laughs> so a hand mixer will really do it, you know, like whip it like you were doing um, whipping cream and to, to, to peat. Yes. Okay. And that's it. That's the base of this coffee. And then you use, um, have a glass of milk, maybe an eight ounce glass of milk, and you just kind of put this topping on top of that and you stir. And you have yourself a very nice, fluffy, cloudy coffee concoction. It's it's quite a treat. That's next on my list. I'm going <laughs> to do that. Sounds it's not perfect. that much of a recipe, but I, I'll send you what I've got. The, 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 on the plus side, it's very hard to screw up, it sounds like. Right, right. You just have to really be patient, though. Just when you think it's almost done, it's really not. You have to get it to consistency of like a uh, soft cool whip to okay. be able to make it pretty and worth your while. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you know, you mentioned walking, my dogs have never been more in shape and I think they're actually resenting me for taking them on, on too many walks. Um, the beagle plopped down on the sidewalk today because he's had enough. So, <laughs> but you know what? Hey, their mommy's getting a lot of exercise that she normally wouldn't have. So we will continue this conversation definitely. We have so much more to talk about. Again, as I mentioned at the top of the program, Debbie sent me a list this long and my list is equally long. And we have books, we have movies, we have TV shows that we promise will be worth your while. So this has been so much fun. This is all the time we have today. Tune in next week when Debbie Baldwin and I will pick up where we left off. And maybe you, our viewers, our listeners, our audience out there can chime in about some of your favorite shows and your favorite Please. diversions for, for staying busy and staying engaged during this time. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next time on The Stir. Thank you.